Chapter 7 The Origin of Species Each species is a masterpiece of evolution that humanity could not possibly duplicate even if we somehow accomplish the creation of new organisms by genetic engineering. E. O. Wilson In 1928, a young German zoologist named Ernst Mayer set off for the wilds of Dutch New Guinea to collect plants and animals. Fresh from graduate school, he lacked any field experience but did have three things going for him. A lifelong love of birds, tremendous enthusiasm, and, most important, the financial backing of the British banker and amateur naturalist, Lord Walter Rothschild. Rothschild owned the world's largest private collection of bird specimens and hoped that Mayer's efforts would add to it. Over the next two years, Mayer tramped through the mountains and jungles with his notebooks and collecting gear. Often alone, he was the victim of bad weather, treacherous paths, repeated illnesses, a serious matter in those pre-antibiotic days, and the xenophobia of the locals, many of whom had never seen a Westerner. Nevertheless, his one-man expedition was a great success. Mare brought back many specimens new to science, including twenty-six species of birds and thirty-eight species of orchids. The New Guinea work launched his stellar career as an evolutionary biologist, culminating in a professorship at Harvard University, where, as a graduate student, I was honored to have him as a friend and mentor. Mare lived exactly one hundred years producing a stream of books and papers up to the day of his death. Among these was his 1963 classic, Animal Species and Evolution, the very book that made me want to study evolution. In it, Mayer recounted a striking fact. When he totaled up the names that the natives of New Guinea's Arfak Mountains applied to local birds, he found that they recognized 136 different types— Western zoologists, using traditional methods of taxonomy, recognized 137 species. In other words, both locals and scientists had distinguished the very same species of birds living in the wild. This concordance between two cultural groups with very different backgrounds convinced Mayer, as it should convince us, that the discontinuities of nature are not arbitrary, but an objective fact. Indeed, perhaps the most striking fact about nature is that it is discontinuous. When you look at animals and plants, each individual almost always falls into one of many discrete groups. When we look at a single wild cat, for example, we are immediately able to identify it as either a lion, a cougar, a snow leopard, and so on. All cats do not blur insensibly into one another through a series of feline intermediates. And although there is variation among individuals within a cluster, as all lion researchers know, each lion looks different from every other. The clusters nevertheless remain discrete in organism space. We see clusters in all organisms that reproduce sexually. These discrete clusters are known as species. And at first sight, their existence looks like a problem for evolutionary theory. Evolution is, after all, a continuous process, so how can it produce groups of animals and plants that are discrete and discontinuous, separated from others by gaps in appearance and behavior? How these groups arise is the problem of speciation, or the origin of the species. That, of course, is the title of Darwin's most famous book, a title implying that he had a lot to say about speciation. Even in the opening paragraph, he claimed that the biogeography of South America would throw some light on the origin of species, that mystery of mysteries, as it has been called by one of our greatest philosophers. The philosopher was actually the British scientist John Herschel. Yet Darwin's magnum opus was largely silent on the mystery of mysteries, and what little it did say on this topic is seen by most modern evolutionists as muddled. Darwin apparently didn't see the discontinuities of nature as a problem to be solved, or thought that these discontinuities would somehow be favored by natural selection. Either way, 
he failed to explain nature's clusters in a coherent way. A better title for the origin of species, then, would have been the origin of adaptations. While Darwin did figure out how and why a single species changes over time, largely by natural selection, he never explained how one species splits into two. Yet in many ways this problem of splitting is just as important as understanding how a single species evolves. After all, the diversity of nature encompasses millions of species, each with its own unique set of traits. And all of this diversity came from a single ancient ancestor. If we want to explain biodiversity, then, we have to do more than explain how new traits arise. We must also explain how new species arise. For if speciation didn't occur, there would be no biodiversity at all, only a single long-evolved descendant of that very first species. For years after publication of The Origin, biologists struggled and failed to explain how a continuous process of evolution produces the discrete groups known as species. The problem of speciation was in fact not seriously addressed until the mid-1930s. Today, well over a century after Darwin's death, we finally have a reasonably complete picture of what species are and how they arise, and we also have evidence for that process. But before we can understand the origin of species, we need to figure out exactly what they represent. One obvious answer is based on how we recognize species, as a group of individuals that resemble one another more than they resemble members of other groups. According to this definition, known as the morphological species concept, the category tiger would be defined something like that group including all Asian cats whose adults are more than five feet long and have vertical black stripes on an orange body with white patches around the eyes and mouth. This is the way that you'll find species of animals and plants described in field guides, and it is the way that Linnaeus first classified species in 1735. But this definition has some problems. In sexually dimorphic species, as we saw in the last chapter, males and females can look very different. In fact, early museum researchers working on birds and insects often misclassified males and females of a single species as members of two different species. It's easy to understand, if you are looking only at museum skins, how male and female peacocks could be classified this way. There is also the problem of variation within an interbreeding group. Humans, for example, could be classified into a few discrete groups based on eye color, those with blue eyes, brown eyes, and green eyes. These are almost unambiguously different, so why don't we consider them different species? The same goes for populations that look different in different places. Humans are again a prime example. The Inuit of Canada look different from the Kung tribes people of South Africa, and both look different from Finns. Do we classify all of these populations as different species? Somehow that strikes us as wrong. After all, members of all human populations can successfully interbreed. And what is true for humans is true for many plants and animals. The North American song sparrow, for example, has been classified into 31 geographic races, sometimes called subspecies, based on small differences in plumage and song. Yet all members of these races can mate and produce fertile offspring. At what point are differences between populations large enough to make us call them different species? This concept makes the designation of species an arbitrary exercise. Yet we know that species have an objective reality and are not simply arbitrary human constructs. Conversely, some groups that biologists recognize as different species look either exactly alike or nearly alike. These cryptic species are found in most groups of organisms, including birds, mammals, plants, and insects. I study speciation in a group of fruit flies, Drosophila, that includes nine species. The females of all these species can't be told apart, even under the microscope, and males can be classified only by tiny differences in the shape of their genitals. Similarly, the malaria-carrying mosquito, 
Anopheles gambii, is one of a group of seven species that look almost exactly alike, but differ in where they live and which hosts they bite. Some do not prey on humans, and so carry no danger of malaria. If we are to combat the disease effectively, it is critical to be able to tell these species apart. Further, because humans are visual animals, we tend to overlook traits that can't easily be seen, like differences in pheromones that often distinguish species of similar-looking insects. You might have asked yourself why, if these cryptic forms look so similar, we think that they're actually different species. The answer is that they coexist in the same location and yet never exchange genes. The members of one species simply don't hybridize with members of another. You can test this in the laboratory by doing breeding experiments or by looking at the genes directly to see if the groups are exchanging them. The groups are thus reproductively isolated from one another. They constitute distinct gene pools that don't intermingle. It seems reasonable to assume that under any realistic view of what makes a group distinct in nature, these cryptic forms are distinct. And when we think of why we feel that brown-eyed and blue-eyed humans, or Inuit and Kung, are members of the same species, we realize that it's because they can mate with each other and produce offspring that contain combinations of their genes. In other words, they belong to the same gene pool. When you ponder cryptic species and variations within humans, you arrive at the notion that species are distinct not merely because they look different, but because there are barriers between them that prevent interbreeding. Ernst Mayer and the Russian geneticist Theodosius Dobshansky were the first to realize this, and in 1942 Mayer proposed a definition of species that has become the gold standard for evolutionary biology. Using the reproductive criterion for species status, Mayer defined a species as a group of interbreeding natural populations that are reproductively isolated from other such groups. This definition is known as the Biological Species Concept, or BSC. Reproductively isolated simply means that members of different species have traits, differences in appearance, behavior, or physiology, that prevent them from successfully interbreeding, while members of the same species can interbreed readily. What keeps members of two related species from mating with each other? There are many different reproductive barriers. Species might not interbreed simply because their mating or flowering seasons don't overlap. Some corals, for example, reproduce only one night a year, spewing out masses of eggs and sperm into the sea over a several-hour period. Closely related species living in the same area remain distinct, because their peak spawning periods are several hours apart, preventing eggs of one species from meeting sperm from another. Animal species often have different mating displays or pheromones and don't find one another sexually attractive. Females in my Drosophila species have chemicals on their abdomens that males of other species find unappealing. Species can also be isolated by preferring different habitats, so they simply don't encounter one another. Many insects can feed and reproduce on only one single species of plant, and different species of insects are restricted to different species of plants. This keeps them from meeting others at mating time. Closely related species of plants can be kept apart because they use different pollinators. Two species of the monkey flower, Mimulus, for example, live in the same area of the Sierra Nevada, but rarely interbreed because one species is pollinated by bumblebees and the other by hummingbirds. Isolating barriers can also act after mating. Pollen from one plant species might fail to germinate on the pistil of another. If fetuses are formed, they might die before birth. This is what happens when you cross a sheep with a goat. Or even if hybrids survive, they may be sterile. The classic example is the vigorous but sterile mule, the offspring of a female horse and a male donkey. Species that produce sterile hybrids certainly can't exchange genes. And of course, several of these barriers can act together. 
For much of the last ten years, I've studied two species of fruit fly that live on the tropical volcanic island of Sao Tome, off the west coast of Africa. The species are somewhat isolated by habitat. One lives on the upper part of the volcano, the other at the bottom, though there is some overlap in their distributions. But they also differ in courtship displays, so even when they do meet, members of the two species rarely mate. When they do succeed at mating, the sperm of one species is poor at fertilizing the eggs of the other, so that relatively few offspring are produced, and half of these hybrid offspring, all of the males, are sterile. Putting all these barriers together, we conclude that the species exchange virtually no genes in nature, and we have confirmed this result by sequencing their DNA. These, then, can be considered good biological species. The advantage of the BSC is that it takes care of many of the problems that appearance-based species concepts can't handle. What are those cryptic groups of mosquitoes? They are different species because they don't exchange genes. What about Inuit and Kung? These populations may not mate directly with each other. I doubt that such a union has ever occurred. But there is potential gene flow from one population to the other through intermediate geographical areas, and little doubt that if they did mate, they'd produce fertile offspring. And males and females are members of the same species because their genes unite at reproduction. According to the BSC, then, a species is a reproductive community, a gene pool. And this means that a species is also an evolutionary community. If a good mutation crops up within a species, say a mutation in tigers that boosts a female's output of cubs by 10%, then the gene containing that mutation will spread throughout the tiger species. But it won't go any further, for tigers don't exchange genes with other species. The biological species, then, is the unit of evolution. It is, to a large extent, the thing that evolves. This is why members of all species generally look and behave pretty much alike, because they all share genes. They respond in the same way to evolutionary forces. And it is the lack of interbreeding between species living in the same area that not only maintains species differences in appearance and behavior, but also allows them to continue diverging without limits. But the BSC isn't a foolproof concept. What about organisms that are extinct? They can hardly be tested for reproductive compatibility. So museum curators and paleontologists must resort to traditional appearance-based species concepts and classify fossils and specimens by their overall similarity. And organisms that don't reproduce sexually, such as bacteria and some fungi, don't fit the criteria of the BSC either. The question of what constitutes a species in such groups is complicated, and we're not even sure that asexual organisms form discrete clusters in the way that sexual ones do. But despite these problems, the biological species concept is still the one that evolutionists prefer when studying speciation, because it gets to the heart of the evolutionary question. Under the BSC, if you can explain how reproductive barriers evolve, you've explained the origin of species. Exactly how these barriers arise puzzled biologists for a long time. Finally, around 1935, biologists began to make headway in both the field and laboratory. One of the most important observations was made by naturalists, who noticed that so-called sister species, species that are each other's closest relatives, were often separated in nature by geographical barriers. Sister species of sea urchins, for example, were found on opposite sides of the Isthmus of Panama. Sister species of freshwater fish often inhabited separated river drainages. Could this geographic separation have something to do with how these species arose from a common ancestor? Yes, said the geneticists and naturalists and they eventually proposed how the combined effects of evolution and geography could make this happen. How do you get one species to divide into two, separated by reproductive barriers? 
Mayer argued that these barriers were merely the byproducts of natural or sexual selection that caused geographically isolated populations to evolve in different directions. Suppose, for example, that an ancestral species of flowering plant was split into two portions by a geographic barrier, like a mountain range. The species may, for example, have been dispersed over the mountains in the stomachs of birds. Now imagine that one population lives in a place having a lot of hummingbirds but only a few bees. In that area, the flowers will evolve to attract hummingbirds as pollinators. Typically, the flowers would become red, a color that the birds find attractive, produce copious nectar, which rewards birds, and have deep tubes to accommodate hummingbirds' long bills and tongues. The population on the other side of the mountain may find its pollinator situation reversed. Few hummingbirds, but many bees. There the flowers will evolve to attract bees. They may become pink, a color bees favor, and evolve shallow nectar tubes with less nectar. Bees have short tongues and don't require a large nectar reward. As well as flatter flowers whose petals form a landing platform, Unlike hovering hummingbirds, bees usually land to collect nectar. Eventually, the two populations would diverge in the form of their flowers and amount of their nectar, and each would be specialized for pollination by only a single type of animal. Now imagine that the geographic barrier disappeared, and the newly diverged populations found themselves back in the same area, an area containing both bees and hummingbirds. They would now be reproductively isolated. Each type of flower would be served by a different pollinator, so their genes would not mix via cross-pollination. They would have become two different species. This is, in fact, the likely way that the monkey flowers we considered earlier did diverge from their common ancestor. This is just one way that a reproductive barrier can evolve by divergent selection. That is, selection that drives different populations in different evolutionary directions. You can imagine other scenarios in which geographically isolated populations diverge so that later they could not interbreed. Different mutations affecting male behaviors or traits could appear in different places, say, longer tail feathers in one population and orange color in another. And sexual selection might then drive the populations in different directions. Eventually, females in one population would prefer long-tailed males, and females in the other, orange males. If the two populations later encountered each other, their mating preferences would prevent them from mixing genes, and they would be considered different species. But what about the sterility and inviability of hybrids? This was a big problem for early evolutionists who had trouble seeing how natural selection could yield such palpably maladaptive and wasteful features. But suppose that these features were not selected directly, but were simply accidental byproducts of genetic divergence, divergence caused by natural selection or genetic drift. If two geographically isolated populations evolve along different pathways long enough, their genomes can become so different that, when they're put together in a hybrid, they just don't work well together. This can disrupt development, causing hybrids to either die prematurely or, if they live, turn out to be sterile. It's important to realize that species don't arise, as Darwin thought, for the purpose of filling up empty niches in nature. We don't have different species because nature somehow needs them. Far from it. The study of speciation tells us that species are evolutionary accidents. The clusters so important for biodiversity don't evolve because they increase that diversity, nor do they evolve to provide balanced ecosystems. They are simply the inevitable result of genetic barriers that arise when spatially isolated populations evolve in different directions. In many ways, biological speciation resembles the speciation of two closely related languages from a common ancestor, an example is German and English, two sister tongues. Like species, languages can diverge in isolated populations that once shared an ancestral tongue. And languages change more rapidly when there is less mixing of individuals from different populations. While populations change genetically via natural selection, and sometimes genetic drift, 
Human languages change by linguistic selection. Appealing or useful new words get invented. And linguistic drift. Pronunciations change due to imitation and cultural transmission. During biological speciation, populations change genetically to the extent that their members no longer recognize each other as mates, or their genes can't cooperate to produce a fertile individual. Likewise, languages can diverge to the extent that they become mutually unintelligible. English speakers don't automatically understand German and vice versa. Languages are like biological species in that they occur in discrete groups rather than as a continuum. The speech of any given person can usually be placed unambiguously in one of the several thousand human languages. The parallel goes even further. The evolution of languages can be traced back to the distant past and a family tree drawn up by cataloging the similarities of words and grammar. This is very like reconstructing an evolutionary tree of organisms from reading the DNA code of their genes. We can also reconstruct proto-languages or ancestral tongues by looking at the features that descendant languages have in common. This is precisely the way biologists predict what missing links or ancestral genes should look like. And the origin of languages is accidental. People don't start to speak in different tongues just to be different. New languages, like new species, form as a byproduct of other processes, as in the transformation of Latin to Italian in Italy. The analogies between speciation and languages were first drawn by, who else? Darwin, in The Origin. But we shouldn't push this analogy too far. Unlike species, languages can cross-fertilize, adopting phrases from each other, like the English use of the German angst and kindergarten. Steven Pinker describes other striking similarities and differences between the diversification of languages and species in his engrossing book, The Language Instinct. The idea that geographic isolation is the first step in the origin of species is called the theory of geographic speciation. The theory can be stated simply. The evolution of genetic isolation between populations requires that they first be geographically isolated. Why is geographic isolation so important? Why can't two new species just arise in the same location as their ancestor? The theory of population genetics, and a lot of lab experiments, tell us that splitting a single population into two genetically isolated parts is very difficult if they retain the opportunity to interbreed. Without isolation, selection that could drive populations apart has to work against the interbreeding that constantly brings individuals together and mixes up their genes. Imagine an insect living in a patch of woods that harbors two types of plants on which it can feed. Each plant requires a different set of adaptations to use it, for they have different toxins, different nutrients, and different odors. But as each group of insects within the area begins adapting to one plant, it also mates with insects adapting to the other plant. This constant intermixing will keep the gene pool from splitting into two species. What you will probably wind up with is just a single, generalist species that uses both plants. Speciation is like separating oil and vinegar. Though striving to pull apart, they won't do so if they're constantly being mixed. What is the evidence for geographic speciation? What we're asking about here is not whether speciation happens, but how. We already know from the fossil record, embryology, and other data that species diverged from common ancestors. What we really want to see is geographically separated populations turning into new species. This is no easy task. First of all, speciation in organisms other than bacteria is usually slow, much slower than the splitting of languages. My colleague Alan Orr and I calculated that, starting with one ancestor, it takes roughly between 100,000 and 5 million years to evolve two reproductively isolated descendants. The glacial pace of speciation means that, with a few exceptions, we can't expect to witness the whole process, or even a small part of it, over a human lifetime. To study how species form, we must resort to indirect methods testing predictions derived from the theory of geographic speciation. 
The first prediction is that if speciation depends largely on geographical isolation, there must have been lots of opportunities during the history of life for populations to experience that isolation. After all, there are millions of species on Earth today. But geographic isolation is common. Mountain ranges rise, glaciers spread, deserts form, continents drift, and drought divides a continuous forest into patches separated by grassland. Each time this happens, there is a chance for a species to be sundered into two or more populations. When the Isthmus of Panama was formed about three million years ago, the emerging land separated populations of marine organisms on either side, organisms that originally belonged to the same species. Even a river can serve as a geographical barrier for many birds that don't like to fly over water. But populations don't have to become isolated by the formation of geographic barriers. They might simply become separated by accidental long-distance dispersal. Suppose that a few wayward individuals, or even a single pregnant female, go astray and end up colonizing a distant shore. The colony will thereafter evolve in isolation from its mainland ancestors. This is just what happens on oceanic islands. The chances for this kind of isolation through dispersal are even greater on archipelagos, where individuals can occasionally move back and forth between neighboring islands, each time becoming geographically isolated. Each round of isolation provides another chance for speciation. This is why archipelagos harbor the famous radiations of closely related species, such as the fruit flies of Hawaii, the anolis lizards of the Caribbean, and the finches of the Galapagos. There's been ample opportunity for geographic speciation then, but has there been enough time? That, too, is not a problem. Speciation is a splitting event, in which each ancestral branch splits into two twigs, which themselves split later, and so on as the tree of life ramifies. This means that the number of species builds up exponentially, although some branches are pruned through extinction. How fast would speciation need to be to explain the present diversity of life? It's been estimated that there are 10 million species on Earth today. Let's raise that to 100 million to take into account undiscovered species. It turns out that if you started with a single species 3.5 billion years ago, you could get 100 million species living today, even if each ancestral species split into two descendants only once every 200 million years. As we've seen, real speciation happens a lot faster than that, so even if we account for the many species that evolved but went extinct, time is simply not a problem. What about the critical idea that reproductive barriers are the byproduct of evolutionary change? That, at least, can be tested in the laboratory. Biologists do this by performing selection experiments, forcing animals or plants to adapt through evolution to different environments. This is a model of what happens when isolated natural populations encounter different habitats. After a period of adaptation, the different populations are tested in the lab to see if they've evolved reproductive barriers. Since these experiments take place over tens to dozens of generations, while speciation in the wild takes thousands of generations, we can't expect to see the origin of full species. But we should occasionally see the beginnings of reproductive isolation. Surprisingly, even these short-duration experiments quite often produce genetic barriers. More than half of these studies, there are about 20 of them all done on flies because of their short generation time, give a positive result, often showing reproductive isolation between populations within a year after selection begins. Most often, adaptation to different environments, different types of food, for example, or the ability to move up versus down in a vertical maze, results in mating discrimination between the populations. We're not sure exactly what traits the populations use to discriminate against each other, but the evolution of genetic barriers in such a short time confirms a key prediction of geographic speciation. The second prediction of the theory involves geography itself. If populations must usually be physically isolated from one another to become species, then we should find the most recently formed species in different but nearby areas. 
You can get a rough idea of how long ago species arose by looking at the amount of difference between their DNA sequences, which is roughly proportional to the time elapsed since they split from a common ancestor. We can then look for sister species in a group who will have the greatest similarity in their DNA and are thus most closely related, and see if they're geographically isolated. This prediction, too, is fulfilled. We see many sister species divided by a geographic barrier. Each side of the Isthmus of Panama, for example, harbors seven species of snapping shrimp in shallow waters. The closest relative of each species is another species on the other side. What must have happened is that seven ancestral species of shrimp were divided when the isthmus arose from beneath the sea three million years ago. Each ancestor formed an Atlantic and a Pacific species. Snapping shrimp, by the way, are a biological marvel. Their name comes from the way they kill. The shrimp doesn't touch its prey, but by snapping together its single oversized claw creates a high-pressure sonic blast that stuns its victim. Large groups of these shrimp can be so noisy that they confuse the sonar of submarines. It's the same with plants. You can find pairs of sister species of flowering plants in eastern Asia and eastern North America. All botanists know that these areas have similar flora, including skunk cabbage, tulip trees, and magnolias. One survey of plants uncovered nine pairs of sister species, including trumpet vines, dogwoods, and mayapples, with each pair having one species in Asia and its closest relative in North America. Botanists theorized that each of the nine pairs used to be a single species continuously distributed across both continents, but these became geographically isolated and began to evolve separately when the climate became cooler and drier about five million years ago, wiping out the intervening forest. Sure enough, DNA-based dating of these nine pairs puts their divergence times at around five million years. Archipelagos are a good place to find out whether speciation requires physical isolation. If a group has produced species within a cluster of islands, then we should find that the closest relatives live on different islands rather than the same one. Single islands are often too small to allow the geographic separation of populations. That is the first step in speciation. Different islands, on the other hand, are isolated by water and should allow new species to arise easily. This prediction also turns out to be generally true. In Hawaii, for instance, sister species of Drosophila flies usually occupy different islands, this is also true of the lesser-known but still dramatic radiations of flightless crickets and lobelia plants. What's more, the dates of the speciation events in Drosophila have been determined using the fly's DNA, and we find, exactly as predicted, that the oldest species are found on the oldest islands. Still another prediction of the geographic speciation model rests on the reasonable assumption that geographic speciation is still occurring in nature. If that's so, we should be able to find isolated populations of a single species that are beginning to speciate, and show small amounts of reproductive isolation from other populations. And sure enough, there are many examples. One is the orchid, Ceterium halakii, which lives in South Africa. In the northern and eastern parts of the country, it is pollinated by hawk moths and long-tongued flies. To attract these pollinators, the orchid has evolved long nectar tubes in its flowers. Pollination can occur only when the long-tongued moths and flies get close enough to the flower to stick their tongues into the tubes. But in coastal regions, the only pollinators are short-tongued bees, and here the orchid has evolved much shorter nectar tubes. If the populations were to live in an area containing all three types of pollinators, the long and short-tubed flowers would undoubtedly show some genetic isolation, for long-tongued species can't easily pollinate short-tubed flowers and vice versa. And there are many examples of animal species in which individuals from different populations mate less readily than do individuals from the same population. There's a final prediction we can make to test geographic speciation. We should find that reproductive isolation between a pair of physically isolated populations increases slowly with time. 
My colleague Alan Orr and I tested this by looking at many pairs of Drosophila species, each pair having diverged from its own common ancestor at various times in the past. With the molecular clock method described in Chapter 4, we could estimate the time when a pair of species began diverging by counting the number of differences in their DNA sequences. We measured three types of reproductive barriers in the laboratory. Mating discrimination between the pairs and the sterility and inviability of their hybrids. Just as predicted, we found that the reproductive isolation between species increased steadily with time. Genetic barriers between groups became strong enough to completely prevent interbreeding after about 2.7 million years of divergence. That's a long time. It's clear that, at least in fruit flies, the origin of new species is a slow process. The way we discovered how species arise resembles the way astronomers discovered how stars evolve over time. Both processes occur too slowly for us to see them happening over our lifetime. But we can still understand how they work by finding snapshots of the process at different evolutionary stages and putting these snapshots together into a conceptual movie. For stars, astronomers saw dispersed clouds of matter, star nurseries, in galaxies. Elsewhere, they saw those clouds condensing into protostars, and in other places, they saw protostars becoming full stars, condensing further and then generating light as their core temperature became high enough to fuse hydrogen atoms into helium. Other stars were large red giants like Betelgeuse. Some showed signs of throwing off their outer layers into space, and others still were small, dense white dwarfs. By assembling all these stages into a logical sequence, based on what we know of their physical and chemical structure and behavior, we've been able to piece together how stars form, persist, and die. From this picture of stellar evolution, we can make predictions. We know, for example, that stars about the size of our sun shine steadily for about 10 billion years before bulging out to form red giants. Since the sun is about 4.6 billion years old, we know that we're roughly halfway through our tenure as a planet before we'll finally be swallowed up by the sun's expansion. And so it is with speciation. We see geographically isolated populations running the gamut from those showing no reproductive isolation through those having increasing degrees of reproductive isolation as the populations become isolated for longer periods and finally to complete speciation. We see young species descended from a common ancestor on either side of geographic barriers like rivers or the Isthmus of Panama and on different islands of an archipelago. Putting all this together, we conclude that isolated populations diverge and that when that divergence has gone on for a sufficiently long time, reproductive barriers develop as a byproduct of evolution. Creationists often claim that if we can't see a new species evolve during our lifetime, then speciation doesn't occur. But this argument is fatuous. It's like saying that because we haven't seen a single star go through its complete life cycle, stars don't evolve. Or because we haven't seen a new language arise, languages don't evolve. Historical reconstruction of a process is a perfectly valid way to study that process and can produce testable predictions. We can predict that the sun will begin to burn out in about five billion years, just as we can predict that laboratory populations artificially selected in different directions will become genetically isolated. Most evolutionists accept that geographic isolation of populations is the most common way that speciation takes place. This means that when closely related species live in the same area, a common situation, they actually diverged from each other during an earlier time when their ancestors were geographically isolated. But some biologists think that new species can arise without the need for any geographic separation. In The Origin, for example, Darwin repeatedly suggested that new species, especially plants, could arise within a very small, circumscribed area. And since Darwin's time, biologists have argued fiercely about the likelihood that speciation could occur without geographic barriers. This is called sympatric speciation, from the Greek for same place. The problem with this, as I mentioned before, 
is that it's hard to split one gene pool in two while its members remain in the same area, because interbreeding between the diverging forms will constantly be pulling them back into a single species. Mathematical theories show that sympatric speciation is possible, but only under restrictive conditions that may be uncommon in nature. It's relatively easy to find evidence for geographic speciation, but it's much harder for sympatric speciation. If you see two related species living in one area, that doesn't necessarily mean that they arose in that area. Species constantly shift their ranges as their habitats expand and contract during long-term changes in climate, episodes of glaciation, and so on. Related species living in the same place may have arisen elsewhere and come into contact with each other only later. How can we be sure, then, that two related species living in one place actually arose in that place? Here's one way to do it. We can look at habitat islands— small patches of isolated terrain, like oceanic islands, or water, like tiny lakes, that are generally too small to contain any geographic barriers. If we see closely related species in these habitats, we could conclude that they formed sympatrically, since the possibility of geographic isolation is remote. There are only a few examples. The best involves cichlid fish in two tiny lakes in Cameroon, these isolated African lakes, filling the craters of volcanoes, are too small to permit populations within them to become spatially separated. Their areas are 0.2 and 1.6 square miles, respectively. Nevertheless, each lake contains a different mini-radiation of species, each recently descended from a common ancestor. One lake has 11 species, the other nine. This is perhaps the best evidence we have for sympatric speciation, although we don't know how and why it happened. Another case involves palm trees on Lord Howe, an oceanic island lying in the Tasman Sea about 350 miles off the east coast of Australia. Although the island is small, about five square miles, it contains two native species of palms, the Cantia and Curly palms, which happen to be each other's closest relatives. The Kentia palm may be familiar. It's a popular houseplant throughout the world. These appear to have arisen from an ancestral palm that lived on the island about five million years ago. The chance that this speciation involved geographic isolation appears quite small, especially because the palms are pollinated by wind, which can spread pollen over a large area. There are a few more examples of sympatric speciation, though they're not quite as convincing as these. What is most surprising, however, is the number of times that sympatric speciation has not occurred given the opportunity. There are many habitat islands that contain a fair number of species, but none of these are each other's closest relatives. Obviously, sympatric speciation has not occurred on those islands. My colleague Trevor Price and I surveyed bird species on isolated oceanic islands, looking for the presence of close relatives that might indicate speciation. Of 46 islands we examined, not a single one contained endemic bird species that were each other's closest relatives. A similar result was seen for anolis lizards, the small green animals often sold in pet shops. Closely related anolis species simply aren't found on islands smaller than Jamaica, which is large, mountainous, and varied enough to allow geographic speciation. The absence of sister species on these islands shows that sympatric speciation can't be common in these groups. It also counts as evidence against creationism. After all, there's no obvious reason why a creator would produce similar species of birds or lizards on continents but not on isolated islands. By similar, I mean so similar that evolutionists would regard them as close relatives. Most creationists do not accept species as relatives since that presupposes evolution. The rarity of sympatric speciation is precisely what evolutionary theory predicts and is further support for that theory. There are, however, two special forms of sympatric speciation that are not only common in plants, but also give us our only cases of speciation in action, species actually forming during a human lifetime. One of them is called allopolyploid speciation. 
The curious thing about this form of speciation is that instead of beginning with isolated populations of the same species, it starts with a hybridization of two different species that live in the same area. And it usually requires that those two different species also have different numbers or types of chromosomes. Because of this difference, a hybrid between the species won't undergo proper pairing of chromosomes when it tries to make pollen or ovules, and it will be sterile. However, if there was a way to double every chromosome in that hybrid, each chromosome would now have a pairing partner, and the doubled chromosome hybrid would be fertile. And it would also be a new species, because while interfertile with other similar hybrids, it would be unable to interbreed with either of the original two parent species, for such a mating would yield sterile offspring with odd numbers of chromosomes. In fact, such doubled chromosome allipoloploids occur with regularity, giving rise to new species. Polyploid speciation doesn't always require hybridization. A polyploid can arise simply by doubling all of the chromosomes of a single species, a process called autopolyploidy. This too results in a new species, for each autopolyploid is able to produce fertile hybrids when mating with other autopolyploids, but produces only sterile hybrids when mating with the original parental species. To get either type of polyploid speciation, you need a rare event to occur in two successive generations, the formation and union of sperm and eggs with abnormally high numbers of chromosomes. Because of this, you might have thought that such speciation would be very rare indeed, but it isn't. Given that a single plant can produce millions of eggs and pollen grains, an improbable event eventually becomes probable. Estimates vary, but in well-studied areas of the world, it's been estimated that as many as a quarter of all species of flowering plants were formed via polyploidy. The fraction of existing species that had a polyploidy event occurring somewhere in their ancestry, on the other hand, could be as high as 70%. This is obviously a common way that new plant species arise. What's more, we find polyploid species in nearly all groups of plants. A notable exception is trees. And many plants used for food or decoration are polyploids or sterile hybrids that had a polyploid parent, including wheat, cotton, cabbage, chrysanthemums, and bananas. This is because humans recognized the hybrids in nature as having useful traits from both parental species, or they deliberately produced the polyploids to create desirable gene combinations. Two everyday examples from your kitchen show this. Many forms of wheat have six sets of chromosomes arising from a complicated series of crosses involving three different species that were made by our ancestors. Commercial bananas are sterile hybrids between two wild species, having two sets of chromosomes from one species and one set from the other. Those black specks in the middle of your banana are, in fact, aborted plant ovules that don't become seeds because their chromosomes can't pair properly. Since banana plants are sterile, they must be propagated from cuttings. Polyploidy is much rarer in animals, appearing only occasionally in fish, insects, worms, and reptiles. Most of these forms reproduce asexually, but there is one sexually reproducing polyploid mammal, the curious red Viscacha rat of Argentina. Its 112 chromosomes are the most seen in any mammal. We don't understand why animal polyploids are so rare. It may have something to do with polyploidy disrupting the mechanism of XY sex determination, or with the inability of animals to self-fertilize. In contrast, many plants do have the ability to self-fertilize, which allows a single new polyploid individual to produce many related individuals that are all members of its new species. Polyploid speciation differs from other types of speciation because it involves changes in chromosome number rather than changes in the genes themselves. It is also immensely faster than normal geographic speciation, for a new polyploid species can arise in just two generations. That is nearly instantaneous in geologic time. And it gives us the unprecedented chance to see a new species appear in real time, satisfying the demand to view speciation in action. We know of at least five new plant species that arose this way.
One is the Welsh groundsel, Senecio cambrensis, a flowering plant in the daisy family. It was first observed in North Wales in 1958. Recent studies have shown that it is in fact a polyploid hybrid between two other species, one of them the common groundsel, Senecio vulgaris, native to the United Kingdom, and the other the Oxford ragwort, Senecio squalidus, introduced to the UK in 1792. The ragwort didn't appear in Wales until about 1910. This means that, given the British penchant for botanizing, which produces a continuous inventory of local plants, the hybrid Welsh groundsel must have arisen between 1910 and 1958. The evidence that it is indeed a hybrid and arose via polyploidy comes from several fronts. For a start, it looks like a hybrid, since it has features of both the common groundsel and the Oxford ragwort. Moreover, it has exactly the chromosome number, 60, predicted for a polyploid hybrid with those two parents. One parent has 40 chromosomes, the other 20. Genetic studies have shown that the genes and chromosomes of the hybrid are combinations of those seen in the parental species. The final proof came from Jacqueline Weir and Ruth Ingram of St. Andrews University in Scotland, who completely synthesized the hybrid species in the laboratory by making various crosses between its two parental species. The artificially produced hybrid looks precisely like the Welsh groundsel seen in the wild. Wild hybrid species are often resynthesized in this way to check their ancestry. There is little doubt, then, that the Welsh groundsel represents a new species that arose in the last hundred years. The other four cases of real-time speciation are similar. All involve hybrids between a native species and an introduced one, although this involves some artificiality in the form of humans moving plants around. It's almost necessary to have this happen if we want to see new species form before our eyes. It seems that polyploid speciation occurs very quickly when the appropriate parental species live in the same place. To see an allopolyploid species arising in nature, then, we must be on the scene soon after its two ancestral species come into close proximity, and this will happen only after a recent biological invasion. But polyploid speciation has occurred, unwitnessed, many times during the course of evolution. We know this because scientists have synthesized polyploid hybrids in the greenhouse that are virtually identical to those that formed in nature long before we were around. And the artificially produced polyploids are infertile with the ones in the wild. All this is good evidence that we've reconstructed the origin of a naturally formed species. These cases of polyploid speciation should satisfy those critics who won't accept evolution unless it happens before their eyes. But even without polyploidy, we still have plenty of evidence for speciation. We see lineages splitting in the fossil record. We see closely related species separated by geographic barriers. And we see new species beginning to arise as populations evolve incipient reproductive barriers. Barriers that are the foundation of speciation. No doubt Mr. Darwin, were he to awaken today, would be delighted to find that the origin of species is no longer a mystery of mysteries.